begin. Welcome to Brown Bag Lunch. I'm um, going to have a wonderful program. I just want to say there are no cards going around today. So we, I guess we have no birthday. Um, I want to tell you that we're going to have what I guess I'm calling a special gathering. One of these next couple of Sundays for Jean Buckner to remember Jean. Um, Jean passed away at 103 and a half. Wow, what a, what a life that lady had. And she requested nothing. She did. She wanted nothing. But we just think that, doesn't it sound like Jean? We just think that she really needs, we just, we just need to get together and remember Jean. It's going to be Sunday at the other, at, at the museum on the fairgrounds, probably from two to four. But I can't tell you yet whether it's going to be, it won't be next Sunday because that's Father's Day. It'll be one of the next two Sundays and the board will make that decision tonight and then we'll let you know. So please plan on coming, coming to that. Also, I was just reminded that there is wonderful work going on at the Hurstville Lime Kilns, which you know the Historical Society has that. And we are putting, we being our volunteers, right, our guys are out there, we're putting a new roof on the picnic shelter. And that picnic shelter really does get used quite a bit. Almost any time during nice weather that you go by the kilns, there's a car or two there with people, you know, wandering around. So that's getting done, and I'm, I'm really grateful to our guys that are over there doing that hard work. Next week, Brown Bag Lunch is going to be, we're going to do again the steps of the Maquoketa Post Office. So our Maquoketa Post Office was built in 1917, and as you walk up those steps, do you ever think to yourself, gee, think of all the people that have walked up these steps. So be thinking of some people that you might like to meet, like to have met, on those stairs. And we'll talk about the post office and some of the people that use that post office through the years. And then, <laughs> so I want to introduce to you, I just met him, he's delightful, um, A.J. Schultz. And he's going to tell you a little bit about himself, because he'll do a better job than I would. And just so you know, I said he was going to be talking about edible landscape, but um, he's deviated. <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. AJ Schultz. So I'm not used to working with the microphone. Maybe I will hold it. Okay, how's that? Is that better? Yeah. Okay, let's get some ground rules in place first. <laughs> I'm way more interested in answering your questions than I am about blabbering on about the same stuff that I always blabber on about during my presentations. So please don't hesitate to interrupt me with whatever question you have, whether it's about bees or edible landscaping or my family or whatever else in the world you can imagine you want to ask. I'm way more interested in that than I am about my slideshow presentation. However, it's a good presentation, but I'm just letting you know. Don't be shy with your questions. Fair enough? Okay. Two, I have not worked with microphones very much, so if I'm not doing very well, please let me know, because I can't hear what you're hearing. I only hear my big mouth yapping up here. So if you can't hear me, it's important to me that you do, because what else are we doing here? So let me know. Just louder! Whatever it is that you got to do. Please let me know. Fair enough? Okay. Thank you. Um, first off, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate this. I like to talk, and I talk a lot. I talk for a living in a lot of ways, and the opportunity to do it in my hometown is very exciting for me. So thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, my name is AJ Schultz. I want to give you a little bit of my history so we know who we're talking with here. Um, my parents moved me and my family to Makokata in 1981. My dad was Lauren Schultz. He started as the assistant city manager with Pat Callahan and was the economic development director in Makoka for a number of years. My mom is Lynn Schultz. She's done a whole bunch of stuff in Makoka, like she ran the Pumpkin Patch, it was a kid's clothing store in the 80s next to Max Ray, between Max Ray and Oster House. And she was the volunteer coordinator for the county. She's done a whole bunch of stuff. Anyway, those are my parents. I grew up here, I went to Sacred Heart. I was uh, the first grade to not go to the middle school. I was the, I went to, from Sacred Heart to the junior high, but then became a middle school as a seventh grader, so I got to skip. So I was only there for two years. Um, I graduated and basically left. 
and I went all over the world, and I ended up marrying a girl from Andrew, and we moved back here to have kids, because this is a great place to have kids. So that's a real quick version of uh, my background. Um, my wife got a job working with Brenda at Brenda's Flowers, and we bought Brenda's Flowers about four years ago, and then last year, uh, Wendy Scott informed us that she wanted to retire, and we ended up buying her on hands. And so now my wife and I own the Iowa Flower Market and uh, sell flowers. And I personally work in Dubuque at a nonprofit called Convivium Urban Farmstead. We're a little farm. We're not really even a farm. We're a restaurant. It used to be a greenhouse on the north end of Dubuque. And I've gotten gardens all throughout the neighborhood in people's backyards where I grow about 4,000 pounds of food a year that goes right into the restaurant. And we serve all sorts of people food, and I teach all sorts of classes on gardening. Our mission at Convivium is to improve life through food. And uh, one of the things that I do as the farm manager at Convivium is I raise bees. And I do it right in the neighborhood in 28th and Jackson on the north end of Dubuque. And I kind of got tossed into it, literally tossed into it. My boss said, hey, go meet up with this guy at his house. And so I went, and within five minutes, the guy handed me a frame full of bees. And I was standing there wondering how I ended up in this situation, which is a feeling I've had a lot in my life. Um, holding this frame of bees with bees crawling all over me and the guy telling me to be calm. And that was the starting point. And now here I am telling you about honeybees. So what ended up happening was that I was asked to give a talk um, by Bonnie. And I wasn't quite sure what to talk about. I was at the time developing a class for Convivium on edible landscaping. That's part of my background. I spent some time on the west coast in California as an edible landscaper. I would remove everything out of the landscape that wasn't edible or didn't support edible plants, and I would make the whole yard a garden. Um, so she asked me to do a presentation. I started putting together one on edible landscaping, uh, but my wife and I just bought a business, and it's springtime at Convivium, and I've got 200 gardens to plant. And I honestly didn't put it together in time, and so I thought, so I called Bonnie and I said, I'm not going to do this, but what are the other topics? And we got talking, and I went through all the curriculum that I have at Convivium, and they were all classes about teaching you how to do something. And I didn't want to teach you how to do something. I wanted something where I could just present you with really cool information. And then I remembered I have bees, and I'm telling you, I don't know how much you know about honeybees, but they're... They're unbelievable, what they do. And so what I'm trying to do is just to get a little bit of an insight into like how bananas these little creatures are. And so that's what I want to talk about today. Again, if it's not interesting, just ask me a question about something that's interesting. <laughs> All right. I think that's everything I wanted to say in the introduction slide. So are we okay starting to talk about bees? Yeah. Okay. Um, the first thing, it doesn't fit into any of the categories that I'm going to talk about, but it's kind of a foundational concept, is the idea that bees have a complete life cycle. I don't know how well you remember junior high biology, but insects have two life cycles, the complete life cycle and the incomplete life cycle. An incomplete life cycle is like an aphid. They're born an aphid, and they just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Whereas butterflies, bees, other insects have a complete life cycle where they start off as an egg, and they're born as a larva, and they live a life as a larva, and then they climb into a cocoon of some sort, and in that cocoon, they literally, their body melts into a goo, and then reforms into the insect. So that's a complete life cycle. So I just need to note that, because I talk about it in a little bit. So, bees have incomplete life cycles, and we're gonna start off talking about the individual bees in a colony. There's three types of bees in any bee colony. There's the queen, and there's one in every colony. Sometimes there's a mother, daughter, pair, but only for a little while because they tend to kill one another. Because there's only supposed to be one. There are drones, who are the males. We'll talk about them in a second. And there's the workers. Uh, here's a picture of the actual bees. The queen is on the left. She's long abdomen. The drones are big meatheads with these giant eyes on top of their head. And the humble worker is down at the bottom. So, the queen. The queen is born from a regular old egg. Some other queen lays an egg. It's a regular egg. 
but the worker bees take that egg and they put it in an extra big cell. And they turn that regular egg into a queen. They give it the big cell. Um, they feed all bees two things, royal jelly and bee bread. Um, but the queen only gets royal jelly. She doesn't get any of the bee bread that all the workers are, are fed. And we don't know if it's the exclusion of the bee bread or the increase in royal jelly, but somehow that triggers some biological thing in her genes to grow into a queen. That's all, just the different food that they're fed. It's the same as everybody else. She just starts off as a worker, but because she's given this special diet, she turns into a queen. Um, she spends three days as an egg, and then the egg hatches, and she spends nine days as a larva, and then she climbs into the cocoon and pupates for four days, and then emerges as the queen. But what usually happens is if the colony needs a new queen, they make a whole bunch. And then what happens is, when the first queen emerges, she goes on the hunt to find all the other queen cells, and she opens them up, and she kills them. <laughs> what? That's crazy! Right, anyway. So, if somebody, har somebody hatches before, the, before she finds them, then they fight. They fight to the death, but only one queen emerges. It sounds really dramatic, but it is! It's what's going on all the time. So anyway, one queen emerges. Okay, we thought that other stuff was weird. This is really weird. So buckle up. So, this queen, she's been born, she just fought for her life, she defeated all the other queens, and now she's going to go out on her mating flight. See, this is the thing. This is the thing. You grow up and you live your whole life not knowing this information. And then suddenly you get told this information, and now you got to walk around with the stuff inside of your head knowing this is going on around you all the time. <laughs> So this is what it is, right? This queen takes off. There's, there's areas around us called drone congregation areas. During the day, all those drones with the big eyes, they go to these things in the sky that are shaped like inverted cones. And they're 30 yards wide and 600 feet tall. And they swarm. And this queen flies up into the cone and then just kind of free falls and drops. And as she drops, she mates. She mates her way down through the cone with like 10 to 20 different of these drones, just collecting as much semen as she can. And then she flies back to her thing. So now you gotta drive around town. You gonna go get some groceries? You got a drone congregation area? I have no idea. They're all over the place. And these drone congregation areas have drones from dozens and dozens and dozens of different hives located all over the place. I don't know about you guys, but that just makes me crazy, man. That's going on around us all the time. So anyway, the queen mates 10 to 20 times, each one about 5 seconds, then she returns to the hive. After she returns to the hive, she lays eggs for the rest of her life. Usually 4 to 5 years, a queen will leave 4 to 5 years. And she lays up to 1,600 eggs a day. That's it. And what she does is she goes, boop, and she releases a fertilized egg to make a worker, or she goes, boop, and she lays an unfertilized egg, and that turns into a drone. That's all it is. Okay. So let's talk about drones. These guys. Drones don't do anything. Drones are the, the worst example of males in the world. <laughs> they do nothing but hang out and the workers bring them food and they eat, and that's it. They, then they go and they fly in their drone congregation areas, which are all around us. We just don't know where they're at. And they hang out, and then they come back and they get some food, and they're like, thanks for the food. They don't do anything. They don't help out. They don't clean. They don't make food. They don't do anything. They don't have a stinger, which is really cool. So if you have a drone, you can hold it, and it's a bee that you can hold. But you have to override that part of your head that says, don't do that. But if it's a drone, you can hold on to it. They don't have a stinger because their stinger is their penis. And that's what, that's a, not as cool of a use. The stingers are awesome. Anyway, when they mate, just like when a bee stings you, they die. So that's, that's worth it. And then they spend three days as an egg, and then they spend 17 days as a larva, and then four days as a pupa. And I want to point something that's interesting out. Um, so that ends up being 24 days that they're incubating as a, as a child, as whatever you want to call it. 
That's 24 days compared to 16 as a queen or 21 for a worker. So drones spend the most amount of time pupating. And what happens is, right now there's this thing, I'm not going to talk about it very much because it's not as much fun as all the rest of this stuff is, but there's a, 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 a parasite called a varroa mite that's killing off the bees all over the world. And they're, what they do is they attach to the larva while it's inside of its, inside of its cell, and then it, when the larva is born, it's all born deformed and it can't survive. But the drones, this is a good thing that the drones do, since they're in their cell for so long, the varroa mite really likes laying their eggs there because it gives the varroa mite a long time to eat the drone. And so, in the context of beekeeping, what I do is I make these things that are called drone frames, and I put them in my hive, and that's where the queen lays all the drone eggs. And what I do is I take those, and I, when they're full of eggs, I take them out and I stick them in the freezer and I kill all the drones, because I don't need drones, and that kills all the varroa mites. And basically what it is is like a magnet for varroa mites. And so I always am changing out my drone frames and then uh, killing off tons and tons of mites. As a side note, oh, as a side note, uh, bee larvae are edible. They taste like a nut. And that's one of the real reasons that like bears get into beehives isn't because they're like Winnie Pooh the honey. It's because of the protein and the nutrients in the larva. And so I always make it a point anytime I harvest some drones to share them with my coworkers. It's kind of an uh, uh, inauguration? Uh, initiation, there it is. It's kind of an initiation for people at Convivium, better or worse. But just for the record, they taste really good. Um, and drone ones tend to be big. OK, what up with the drones? Bones. Um, workers. This is what really blows my mind all the time. These workers, okay, we'll get to it. Anyway, so they, they're all female. All the workers are female. They spend three days in an egg, 10 days as a larva, and then eight days as a pupa. Um, their life is a series of jobs. And they do it, without question, because that's how the whole colony works. Um, not every bee does all of these jobs. But somebody's always doing these jobs, and it depends on their age. And so I'm going to tell you about some of the jobs that bees have within the colony. Um, right when they're born, they become cleaning bees. And the very first thing they do is they clean their own cell out, the cell that they were, the cell that they were in as an egg and as a larva. The queen will not lay eggs in a dirty cell. And so the bees are meticulous cleaners. And the first thing they do is they clean their own cell. Once they're done with that, they go start cleaning other cells. And then from one to three days, they, uh, they are cleaners. Um, after that age, they become nurse bees. And what the nurse bees do is they take care of the eggs, and they take care of the babies. They feed the other ones, they feed the, like the, the, the larva, because the larvae are pretty helpless. They're like little caterpillars that just sit there and get food dumped on them, and then they gobble stuff out of their, their, thing, out of their, their cell. Um, after uh, 7 to 12 days, you can become a queen's aide. I have a photo later of the queen. Did I show that for the queen? Thank you. Oh, yeah. There it is. That's the queen surrounded by queen aides. And they're the ones that are always like, hey, what do you need? Do you want some water? Can I go back? Can you want a lotion on the feet? Um, once they are done being queen aides, they start to develop Oh, there's the undertaker bee. That's a glorious job. All they do, the undertaker bees carry dead larvae, bad eggs, and dead bees, and they carry them out of the, the hive and just dump them outside the front door. You remember I told you about those, uh, the drone comb? What happens is, I put them in the freezer, and they freeze, and then on the next round, I take them out of the freezer, I let them thaw, and I scrape off some of the wax, and I just put them back in. And then the undertaker bees are like, oh, it's a lot of work, and they take all the drones that died in the freezer, and they carry them out the front door, and they huck them out into a pile, which is crazy to see, because then you see the next day, the very next day, a big pile of dead drones. So, that's another job, the undertaker bee. <laughs> they have to decide, it's, uh, it's, uh, the undertaker bee is kind of an advanced cleaner bee. Um, let's see, the nurse bees, nurse bees can feed up to 1,300 brood cells a day. The queen aid. Oh, the queen aids also have a job we're going to talk about a little bit later, where they have to kill the queen sometimes. Um, once you're 12 to 18 days old, you start producing wax and propolis, 
and you become a wax mason, which is a job where you're either building the, the honeycomb itself or you're filling in the cracks. I'm not sure where I talk about it, but there's this thing that was one of the main triggers for me to be a bee spaz when I was learning about this. It's called bee space. And it's, I think I mentioned it. Anyway, that's there's, there's approximately like three to five eighths of an inch. And if it's any bigger than that, the bees are going to fill it with wax. And if it's smaller than that, they're going to fill it with propolis. So when you're building beehives, everything has to be precision. Because if you mess it up, the bees are going to fix it themselves. And then you've got to deal with the stuff that they did. But that's if the, the, the wax mason bees that are doing all that work. Um, another thing that happens when the pupa are ready to pupate in their thing, or when honey is done, a thin layer of wax covers it up to seal it in, and that's what the wax masons do. Um, at 13 to 18 days old, they are house workers. They do a whole bunch of stuff, and it's really neat. They use their wings to do all this work, like <coughs> circulating air in the hive, keeping it clean, or keeping it cool. Um, when bees come back from foraging, when they're out collecting pollen and nectar and stuff like that, the houseworker bees greet them at the door and then take their honey from them. I'll get into the honey, but they, they have a honey stomach. It's a special stomach, and they chew it up and regurgitate it, chew it and regurgitate it. Um, they clean the pollen off, they take nectar, and they also do the work of making the honey, which I'm going to talk again, I'll talk about later, but basically they pack all this nectar into a cell, and then they use their wings to fan it and fan it and fan it and lower the water content so that it's a super saturated solution of sugar, and that's what honey is. Um, at 18 to 21 days, their stinger has matured, uh -oh. and <laughs> the bee's venom is at its peak at that point, so those bees become guard bees. Um, they check other bees, incoming bees, to make sure, hey, you're from our, you're from our hive, right? And uh, anybody tries to come in like a wasp or a hornet, they kill them and they fight them. The guard bees are really important to beekeeping, because you have to watch how the guard bees are acting in order to tell whether you're going to die that day or not. Um, guard bees tend to, there's a thing called the bee tolerance threshold, where they'll put up with a bunch of your guff to a certain point. And after that, they're going to tell you, like, you better stop doing that. And what they do is they bounce off you. They fly and they kind of headbutt you. And you can always tell, like, ooh, I better back off. Um, or slow down, or give them some smoke, or whatever. But the guard bees do this really funny thing where if you're moving slowly and calmly and everything's going well, they don't even pay attention to you. But if you start doing tricky motions or you breathe on them or you do something, the guard bees come to the edge, and they come to the edge and they go boop. <laughs> and you can look down and see their little faces looking at you. And you know, like, okay, slow down, calm down. But those are the guard bees. Uh, it's really important to know how to keep an eye on them. Um, at 21 to 40 or 45 days, which is about the average lifespan of a, of a, of a honeybee, um, 21 to 45 days is the end of their life. They spend the rest of their life being a forager. That's the breadwinner of the hive. These foragers fly within three to five miles to collect stuff. A three to five mile radius to collect things. They collect nectar, they collect pollen, they collect different plant saps and resin, and they collect water. They just go out, they fly around, and they get it and they bring it back. They work literally until they collapse from exhaustion and die. That's what they do. Um, chances are, if you get stung by a bee, you're getting stung by either a forager or a guard. If you sit down, ah, you, you got stung in your butt, or you put on a jacket that was laying in the grass, or you grab something, it's a forager. And it's not stinging you out of maliciousness, it's stinging you because it's trapped and it's trying to defend itself and it's scared and it's, it stings you. Or you get stung by a guard, and that's basically because you're doing something wrong and you're too close to the hive, or you're acting inappropriately around the hive. Um, otherwise, you're not a flower. You don't, you don't have nectar. They don't care about us, for the most part. They're just trying to protect themselves or they're trapped. So, just that's a, a public service announcement. <laughs> if you do get stung, however, it's important to know about that guy. <laughs> That's the stinger. And how the stinger works is fascinating and terrifying. So I want to tell you about it because especially with honeybees, it's important to know. So for the record, hornets, yellow jackets, all those other jerks, those guys can sting you over and over and over again. Bop, 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 bop. So if you get stung multiple times by the same insect, it's not a honeybee. 
Honey is going to sting you one time, and then it's going to try to escape, and it's going to tear off its stinger in the meantime, and it's going <coughs> to die from that. So, what happens when you get stung by a honeybee is there's three parts, four parts, we'll say four parts to the stinger. After the honeybee leaves, there's four parts. There's these two things, these two barbed edges, and they go like this. There's a muscle that flexes, and they go, and it just digs itself deeper and deeper into your skin every time it flexes. And also every time it flexes, there will be a little poison pouch hanging off the end. And every time it flexes, it goes, and squeezes poison in. So what happens is people make the mistake of going, oh, fiddlesticks, and they grab it, boop, and they pinch it to pull it out. But what happens is you squeeze that poison sac, boop, which is what they want you to do, the jerk. And then it's basically going, and injecting yourself with more bee poison right into your arm. And so what you need to do is take a credit card or a pocket knife. But I always, what I always end up doing is going like this, and scraping it sideways, and that gets it out without Squeezing that poison pouch. Just like that, another public, full of public service. <laughs> I think it's it's just it's fascinating. You can if you look at you can look at videos, or if you unfortunately get stung and stand there making a huge mistake of watching it, it's fascinating to see that little muscle flex and to watch the, the stinger just drive itself deeper and deeper into your into your body. Don't do that. Okay, those are the individual bees that make up the colony. But the individual bees don't really matter because the neat thing about bees is that they function as a colony. We don't consider the individual cells of our body as individuals, right? All the cells work together to make us. And that's what is so cool about the bees is that we need to perceive them on that level. And so let's talk about the colony. The, the purpose of the colony is like any other living thing to biologically succeed and to reproduce and to succeed and to reproduce and to continue the life of that, that entity as long as possible. Um, this is a, uh, a picture of a Langstroth hive, it's called. These were invented, blah, blah, blah. It's the human's best attempt at making the bees comfortable. Um, but it's kind, of, um, it's kind of deceiving, because what's really going on, you have to imagine a football-shaped circle inside of that, which is where the actual hive lives. We just are really bad at building wooden circles that are hollow, and so we build human squares. And the bees say, eh, that's good enough. If the bees didn't like the length of the hive, they would leave, which is one of the, this is an argument for bees, with, for honey, not being vegan. A lot of vegans don't eat animal products, right? But Honey is always on the table like, well, is it an animal product? It's made by animals. But again, the bees could just leave and not let us have their honey, or they could kill us if they didn't want it. And so maybe it's not like an involuntary animal thing. It's a side note. Anyway, this is a Langstroth hive, but you have to imagine inside of it is the circle of what the hive actually looks like. If you see those paper wasp nests, that's a good idea of how it's shaped, but you just have to kind of visualize that. I was going to include a picture of a thermal image of a hive, because that helps you see, but then you can't see what the length of the hive looks like. But it's a big red circle on the inside. In that, in that space, there are between 20 and 80,000 bees in the complete darkness, all doing what they do in order to succeed. In the darkness, just hanging out, peering food, making wax, making propolis, sealing up stuff, and it's all in the dark. I get hung up on the fact that it's in the dark because I'm barely capable of making it down my bedroom stairs without a nightlight in the middle of the night. And they have a whole social structure and hierarchy. And they do more when they get there. So uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, I talked about bee space. <laughs> OK, this is how bees talk. Okay, they have Bees talk in two different ways, in odor and in action. In odor, the queen has a, uh, a pheromone called the queen mandibular pheromone. Uh, that's not important to know because nobody will ever remember, but it's just a neat idea that this queen gives off this scent that tells everybody, hey, it's all okay. My notes are disappearing, so I'm gonna grab this. Thank you for your patience while I do this. Okay, okay. So the queen gives off this scent that tells everybody, I'm okay. Everything's okay. Um, the queen's scent also suppresses the egg-laying abilities 
of the worker bees. They're still females. They still have the ability to lay eggs. They'll just be infertile eggs. They won't do anything, or they'll turn into drones. But the queen mandibular pheromone tells them that that's not necessary. Um, when the bees walk by the queen, and they brush up against her, they get some on her, so then when they walk around the hive, that's how the scent gets spread throughout the hive, is because it's attached to the bees and everybody's smelling it. Um, the second one, besides the queen mandibular pheromone, is an alarm scent, which, again, if you get stuck, that thing's going pss, 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 sending off this pheromone scent to tell the other bees, hey, I'm trying to kill this person. You should try to kill this person too. Come on. <laughs> um, that, oddly enough, I believe it smells like bananas. <laughs> That's the last thing I'm going to remember before I die. <laughs> um, it, but really, it does tell the other bees when there's something to be afraid of, or if there's danger, if there's something bad happening. Um, there's a scent called Nazanoff, which is the specific hive ID, which works in two ways. There will be bees, like see how they got their butts up in the air and they're fanning their wings? They stand at the opening of the hive, and they do that because then that sends the nazanoff of that specific hive out into the air, so the other bees that are coming back with honey know where to go, and they go, oh yeah, here's my home. I can smell it, it's right over there. And also, when they return, some one of the guard bees says, oh yeah, you have the right nazanoff on you. <laughs> and then uh, the foragers, the foragers have a scent that uh, is like a critical mass scent. When there's enough foragers, then everybody's calm, but if the forager scent gets too low, the queen knows, oh, we better start laying some more eggs, we need some more workers. And the amount, it's the level, it's not the existence of, but it's the level of the forager scent that assures everybody that everything's okay. Oh, this is the best one, this is my favorite. So, after odor is action. That's how they communicate. There's a thing called the waggle dance. Has anybody ever heard of the waggle dance before? Oh, man. Have you? What if we talk through dancing? We try, but most of us are too clumsy. Um, so, the first, the first action I want to talk about is the waggle dance. The waggle dance is how bees communicate a location of something. So a forager goes out and finds this beautiful apple tree. It's full of blooms. And it goes back to the hive and it wants to tell everybody else, hey, I found this apple tree. And how they do that, again, in the dark, surrounded by 80,000 other bees, is they do a dance. And what they do is they angle themselves away from the sun in the direction that the tree is at, and then they walk, and do 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 And the distance that they walk communicates how far away the tree is. Yes, exactly. It's crazy. Does anybody here think they could go home and do that to their spouse? I need you to go to the Copper Cardinal and grab a pizza. What you're talking about? It's unbelievable. Yeah. Okay. Where am I at? That's so exciting. Let's go. Okay. Here we go. Oh yeah. Um. There is. Uh. They they use the waggle dance for food to tell a location. Um. They waggle right up the middle. The direction and the length of the waggle tells them where this at. And they circle around and they do it again, over and over again. And it's based on the distance and direction to the sun. Um. There's other dances. There's a dance called a cleaning dance, which I don't know how that works. I don't know what that dance looks like. I would absolutely show you what they look like if I knew. Um, there's a warning dance. That's usually about contaminated food or a predator that they need to know about. Um, a trembling dance when they have too much nectar or like a lot of nectar. Hey, we got a lot of nectar and they get excited. And then there's a buzzing dance when they are communicating it's time to swarm. We're going to talk about swarms because that's a whole other level of fascinating in a second, but there's a buzzing dance to swarm. And then the other action, besides the dances, are headbutts. They use their headbutts to like get attention, which, like I said, if the guard bees are trying to give you a warning, they're just going to fly and headbutt you. But as a human, it just feels like you got bounced on. But that's a little bee headbutt getting your attention, saying, hey, what are you doing? Um, so, after the colony, uh, this is how this group of 80,000 insects makes a decision. Because they do make decisions. It's a thinking entity. It's not just like, I mean, it's, I don't know how to describe what it's not, but they're thinking and they're making decisions. They're conscious decisions that they make. And these decisions are communicated between each other and then they're checked. Is this, is this bee telling the truth? Is there really an apple tree over there? 
And then they're supported or denied. So what happens is a, a bee flying around, checking out, finds this apple tree, gets a bunch of pollen, takes it back, and says, hey, you guys, I found this apple tree. Dance, dance, dance. Some other bee's going to go out there and fly to that same apple tree and say, oh, yeah, this is a good apple tree. And it's going to fly back, and it's going to say, yeah, yeah, this is a good apple tree. And then those bees tell, and those bees tell, and those bees tell, and pretty, no, every, pretty soon everybody knows there's, a, there's an apple tree. Or this bee's going to go out, it's going to find an apple tree, it's going to come back and say, hey, I found this great apple tree. Somebody's going to fly out and say, this is, this is a banana tree. What are you talking about? It smells like a banana tree. They're going to come back and they're going to headbutt and they're going to say, no, it doesn't. And that bee's still saying, no, no, it's a good apple tree. And pretty soon everybody knows that bee's a liar. And that's, that's, that's what they do. They support or they deny. And that is. So, one of the most important decisions that these bees are going to have to make is uh, about replacing the queen. Sometimes they have to replace the queen. If the queen's around for four or five years, she's lived a good life, she's laid a lot of eggs, but her egg laying is getting low. If her queen mandibular pheromone isn't strong anymore, the bees decide, oh, yeah, get rid of this one. <coughs> and, uh, and then they, they make that decision. And what they do is the workers start to make queen cells. There's three types of queen cells. Um, to make queens in. These are the ones earlier when I talked about they take a regular old thing and they stick it in a queen cell. So there's three types of queen cells. The first kind is during an emergency. If I go into the hive and I'm acting like an idiot and I accidentally squish the queen, that's an emergency. Ooh, we need a queen. And they make a queen. And they'll put those types of queen cells right out in the open. They won't make any qualms about that. But if they decide that they're going to uh, get rid of the queen or replace her, they'll hide these little queen cells all throughout the hive in secret places and they won't tell the queen. And when they've got the larva ready, then they kill the queen. What kind of society is this? <laughs> so we're trying to do this. And then, uh, oh, and the last one is, uh, the last type of queen cell, is if they're going to swarm. Um, the swarm cell is the third type. It's when the bees decide to swarm, um, but I need to clarify really quickly. We tend to think of like a swarm of bees as like a cartoon when somebody's being chased by the big buzzing of bees. That's not really what happens. Um, that's what it looks like. It looks like static in the air. I'm lucky enough to have seen this. Um, but what happens in a swarm is that on an individual level, the queen lays eggs and rears individual bees, but the hive has the ability to reproduce itself by swarming. And so what happens is uh, they make this great decision, hey, we've got plenty of food, we've got plenty of pollen, there's lots of eggs laid, let's, let's swarm, let's make a new colony. And so all of the bees eat as much honey as they can and get all fat and plumped up. And the queen does the opposite, loses a bunch of weight, she kind of starts getting her aerobics on, she gets in shape so that she can fly, and then they leave. And the exodus, it's called an exodus. And the baby bees that can't fly and the foragers don't go along because they're not home when all this happens, or they can't fly and take off with them. But the queen and all the bees that are capable all leave. And they fly out and they collect in a location. And I'm not sure if anybody's ever seen this or seen it in pictures, but there's just a giant clump of bees. A lot of times they'll hang off of like a car or you'll see them in a tree or somewhere. That's a swarm. And what happens is they all fly to this place, and they collect in a giant ball of bees, and then from there, these scouts go out, and they go looking for a new place to live. And the scouts come back, and they say, hey, I found this really cool thing. And they go through that decision-making process where somebody else goes and checks it out, and they're like, that's just an old deflated football. Boom, headbutt. Or that's like a great place, let's go. And they make that group decision about this is where we should go live. And once they find a place that they all agree on, the swarm moves to the new house. In the meantime, those bees back at the thing, the nurse bees went, I don't smell a queen, we're out of queen, we need a queen. And so they make a new queen, like we talked about earlier. And now, there's two hives. The original hive that left with the original queen, and the new one that goes through the process of rearing a queen in the cell, and giving her the royal jelly, and she grows up, and goes on the mating flight, and now there's another thing. And that's how, that's how they, they reproduce as a whole. If, as a beekeeper, you're smart enough, and ahead of the game enough, and there's a lot of guesswork, I say that I guess work as a beginning beekeeper. Maybe there's really stuff I should learn about. But 
you can do this thing where you call it splitting the hive, where you go in there and you manually take a bunch of the eggs out, and you make two hives out of one before their biological need to swarm kicks in. I've always lost bees to swarms. However, last year, a hive of mine swarmed out, and it is exactly like this picture. The whole sky is just full of 80,000 bees, and it's the craziest thing. It's not dangerous, necessarily, unless you go try to get in there and attack the queen. Otherwise, they don't care. They're so full of honey for the, for the trip that they don't care. You know that feeling where you walk out of a restaurant and somebody could just be stealing your car and you just go, I don't care. <laughs> That's where the bees are at in that moment. And so I'm not going to do anything. It's, it's just scary looking, but nothing's going to happen. Anyway, what do we got? OK. Um, the products that bees make. This is another thing that's just that just I just can't ever get over. It's bananas what they do, making this stuff. Who doesn't like honey? Anybody, like, anybody not enjoy like a spoonful of honey? Honey is obviously the first product we're going to talk about in the products that the bees make. Foragers go out and collect nectar from flowers. They store it in their honey stomach. They I mean they swallow it. They literally boom oh, boom oh, boom. Oh, they swallow it down. Kind of like cows. Don't cows do that? Uh, they swallow grass and they move it around from stomach to stomach and burp it back up and chew it some more. Well, bees kind of do that with honey. Um, they don't digest it, they just suck it down into their guts. They get about a thousand flowers worth of nectar in order to fill their honey stomach. A thousand flowers worth of nectar to fill their honey stomach. And then they go back to the hive, they regurgitate it, and they pass it mouth to mouth to one of those housekeeper bees that I talked about before. And then housekeeper bee does the same thing. Oh, thank you. Oh, swallows it down in their stomach. And they pass it back and forth throughout the hive over and over again 20 to 30, for 20 to 30 minutes with each bee chewing it up, swallowing it, mixing it with their saliva to, in order to reduce the water content, passing it back and forth. Finally, uh, somebody packs it into a cell and then stands it, like I said, and fans it with their wings to get the water content below 17%. And then, one of those wax masons caps it over with wax. That's what honey is. Each pound of honey, in order to get a pound of honey, the bees had to fly over 50,000 miles and visit 30 million flowers. What? That's a pound of honey. That's, that's, why, that's why stuff like clover is so important, and clover is such a foundational thing for honey, because you can have a field of clover and have millions of flowers. Um, um, so the next product is pollen. Um, obviously, bees don't make pollen, but they harvest pollen. And there's two sides to this. The bees, the bees harvest pollen. They take it back to their hive, and they do stuff with it. We'll talk about that in a second. But before we even get to there, I know that a lot of you guys know about this, but of our 100 top crop varieties that the human beings live on, 90% of them are pollinated by, by bees. They are, while they're collecting the, the pollen for them to eat, the plant is tricking them and being like, yeah, yeah, I got some pollen. <laughs> and the bee is then fertilizing that flower in order to create the fruit and the food that we eat. Again, I know I said it once, but it's a huge concept. Of the 100 top food crops that human beings survive on, 90% of them are pollinated by bees. Um, wait a second, go back up there. So anyway, they take this pollen, they put it, they put it in these, look at, that's called a pollen basket. They've got these baskets on their legs, they're like, what are those things called, uh, hip pouches, is that what they're called? Whatever they're called. Yeah. Fanny packs, yeah. It's like a big fanny pack full of pollen. And they just pack it full of the pollen, they take it back, and it's, I think it's one of the most delicious things to eat. I always feel really terrible when I eat it, but when I harvest the honey from the hives, there's usually little pockets of the pollen in there, and I will scoop it off and I will eat the whole thing. And I'm, 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 if you haven't had the opportunity, try to find somebody that does bees, get some pollen. It tastes, it doesn't taste good, I wouldn't say it tastes good, but it, it tastes like you're eating a meadow. Like you're eating an entire meadow all at once, which is really a phenomenal flavor. Again, I can't say that it's good because it also tastes like you're eating a meadow. <laughs> um, propolis is another product they make. Propolis is basically like a bee caulk. They use the propolis as caulk. Um, 
it's, it's got all sorts of stuff that humans like to eat, and so people take the propolis and they mix it with alcohol to make a tincture and they eat it, it's got all sorts of stuff in it. But basically, in order to make propolis, uh, they take all of this stuff from trees, exudates, uh, sap, all sorts of botanical sources, and they chew it up and they mix it with their saliva. It is uh, actually more complicated than that scientifically, but I'm just going to call it spit. Because that's basically what, as far as the conversation goes, they mix it with spit, and they make this paste, and they use it as caulk. And it is strong. I have special tools to pry apart the boxes that these little bitty insects have glued together with their pollen spit. And again, like I said with the bee space, they use it to fill up cracks smaller than a quarter of an inch. If it's bigger than that, they'll use beeswax. Um, when it's born, it's really pliable. It's impossible to get out of your clothes. It sticks to everything. But when it's cold, it's really bacterial. It's really, uh, it's really brittle. It has antibacterial properties, and it's a uh, super medicinal for the hive as well, because again, it has the exudates from hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of different plants. Um, beeswax is something that they make. I'm sure we all like candles and chapstick. We sell chapstick from my bees at Convivium in Dubuque. It's really cool because there's a lady that I work with who's really inspired, and so I'll grow her herbs and I'll make her beeswax, and she puts them together into these awesome products. And I'm, I'm excited about that because I talk a lot, but let's get chapped. Um, so like I referred to back before during the bee, whose job it is, when they're 12 to 18 days old, um, they get this ability to make the wax. And what they do is they cluster together, and they raise up their body temperatures by clustering together, and then they push out the wax from these abdomen, ab, from their, their belly has these slats in it, and the wax comes out of it, that's all. I don't know how that works. But there's little pieces of wax that they just kind of squeeze out of their guts. I wish I had a better scientific explanation, but I'm just, I just think that's a miracle. That's all. And so each bee can wake about eight, eight wax flakes every 12 hours. So have you ever seen honeycomb? Have you seen honeycomb? Think of how much wax and how many bees have to go and push it out. So there's like a whole, whole, a whole hive of honeycomb. Um, and here's another kicker. Remember how much I told you about how far they had to fly and how many flowers they had to visit in order to make a pound of honey? It takes about 10 pounds of honey to make one pound of wax. So reverse math that back and again, think about that honeycomb. So when I harvest my honey, I just shave that top cap off of it and I put it in this machine that spins it really fast and that draws the honey out of the comb. Uh, and that way I can take that empty beeswax frame and stick it back in the hive, hopefully saving the bees all that labor of making the wax again. But people like to sell those chunks of beeswax, and I always just feel really bad for the bees. <laughs> like, that's so much work. <laughs> that's so much work, and I don't think I'm a lazy person, but I don't have to do all this stuff. Oh, okay, anyway. Um, so, another product that they make is called Royal Jelly. This is the stuff that nurse bees make to feed baby bees. Um, it's made in a fancy gland in nurse bees. It, it consists of two-thirds water, one-eighth proteins, 11% simple sugars, small quantities of vitamin C and various trace minerals and enzymes. And they just, these, again, these nurse bees that are, however, one to four days old, that's if they just not to, not, they make it inside of themselves. It's fed to all the bees. And the queen is fed nothing but royal, gen, royal jelly. Uh, I referred to it a little bit in the beginning when I was talking about queens. I just think it's really cool. It's called epigenetics. I think it's really cool how what a bee eats dictates what it turns into. Like imagine if, wow, I'm okay. Imagine if we were fed nothing but pizza for the first 11 years of our life, and then we turned into like a superhero. That's basically what's happening. Um, genetically, the queen is the same as the worker bees. Um, but they have different, but they, but they have completely different anatomy, and they only live 45 days while the queen lives five, four to five years. And the only difference is that genetically they're the same. The only difference is one was fed this royal jelly stuff that they make. We don't do anything with it. As humans, I think that would be selfish if we did. But I think it's a fascinating thing that they make. Um, and then, the last thing is bee bread. And this is the pollen stuff I was talking about that you can eat that tastes like a, uh, tastes like a meadow. Um, foragers return with pollen. 
the housekeeper bees pack it into the cells with their big heads, and they combine it with nectar and honey and spit, and then they seal it in, and then it ferments inside of that thing. And it's something that they feed the babies. And they all live on it too. They're all the bees, that's one of the things that they eat, that the, that the, uh, the drones eat, so everybody eats it. Um, so, that's what they eat. And that's the last product, and that is uh, the last of my slides. I would love to answer any questions that you have, if I can, about bees, or about edible landscapes, or gardens, or convivium, or what I know about Brenda's and the Iowa flower market, and the forest industry in the which is limited. Um, I also, as a side note, like to metal detect. That's how I connected with the Jackson County Historical Society, because every time I find something Makokoda-ish, I bring it in to help have done, hopefully help me figure out what it is. Um, and I might be doing a talk later about that. And so I have a little bag of um, goodies that I was going to share, but now I'm not. <laughs> um, um, so that's all. That's my intro to question time. If anybody has more questions, I'm obviously a talkative person, and I'd love to answer your questions. Yes, ma'am. I do not have a question, but I want to thank you for reaffirming what I have honestly believed my whole life, and that is that animals are a hell of a lot smarter than human beings. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Everybody heard what she said? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I agree 100%. Yeah, spooky almost. Yeah. Like, wouldn't it be cool if we could live in that kind of harmony? And be wouldn't that, it be like, cool if we could have some of those animals running the country. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, we like things more than honey and bubbles. Stinks bad. <laughs> complicated. Yes, sir? If we lived like animals, we wouldn't need no hospitals. Or jam, jail. Oh, we'd have undertaker bees that would just take us and throw us off the front porch. <laughs> Yeah. Can you explain a little more about the convivium yes. and Dubuque? Yes. All right. Um, it's a good place to eat. Okay. Uh, there were two people, uh, Mike Munch and Leslie Shalaby, who had spent their careers making a bunch of money in the white collar world. And they got old enough that they wanted to retire and give back to the community. And so in Dubuque, they went building shopping, basically. And they looked around for buildings that they could invest in and do a nonprofit something, but they had no idea what they were going to do. They looked at an old schoolhouse and thought they could do an artist collective and they looked at some other stuff. But then they found the Hoppers, Imers, depends on what generation you are, greenhouse on 28th and Jackson in the north end of Dubuque. And Leslie is a, comes from a long line of foodies, and this vision came to her about having a farm where the stuff having a nonprofit where the food grown is fed in the restaurant, people are taught about food and traditions about food. And, uh, and so they bought the building. The Telegraph Herald ran an article about them right away. This was in October of 2013, I believe. And my father-in-law showed me the article. I had recently returned from California, and I came back just to raise family. I led kind of an eco warrior uh, lifestyle on, on the West Coast, and I kind of thought, oh, I'm just going to move back to Iowa, and I'll just get whatever job and raise my kids. But then I saw that article, and I thought, oh, hello. <laughs> and so I contacted them, and I politely informed them that I was going to work for them somehow, and that we should get this project underway. And they thought that was a great idea, and so they hired me. And we started a nonprofit with the idea of improving life through food. We focus on three areas of food. We focus on the production of food, which is my job. I grow food in the gardens, and I teach people how to grow food. I've got a whole huge series of classes. I give talks the third Wednesday of every month, just like this. It's called a lunch and learn, where you come and eat, and I talk about something, usually garden-oriented. Um, so the production of food, we focus on the preparation and preservation of food. We have a learning kitchen, which is set up for multiple people to take cooking classes, where we teach all sorts of classes from just basic knife skills to pairing French wines and cheeses. Right now, we're running a four-week class called Good and Cheap, which is based off a cookbook called Good and Cheap, which teaches people how to feed your family on $4 per person per day, which is what you get if you're on SNAP. And so I think that 
not everybody grows their own food, and not everybody cooks their own food, but everybody eats. And we're not just focused on like helping the underprivileged find food. We want everybody to somehow improve their lives through food. And so preparation, preservation, production, and lastly, the enjoyment of food. And to that end, we have a coffee shop and a restaurant, and our event center gets rented out for weddings and all sorts of events all the time. We do catering, and all the money from that it's full, after everybody's paychecks are paid, obviously, because we have servers and cooks. After that, all the money gets folded back into the nonprofit. Um, we have classes, events, demonstrations in each of those three areas, and uh, that's, that's what we do. Uh, I, I have, like I said, I have gardens throughout the neighborhood because we don't have a lot of space that Convivium owns. I asked a woman who had a hair salon if I could grow in her backyard at the hair salon, and she thought it was a great idea. Little did I know that there's a lot of talky talky chitter chatter that goes on in hair salons. And the word spread, and pretty soon people in the neighborhood were saying, hey, you can do that in my yard. Hey, do that in my yard. And now I grow about 4,000 pounds of produce in the neighborhood, and that comes into the restaurant. And we serve it in the restaurant, or we bottle it up and sell it as merch. We sell really good pesto and jams. And uh, an interesting thing that happened was during COVID, we were unable to. During COVID, all the restaurants shut down, right? But most restaurants can just call their distributor and say, I don't bother delivering a truck this week. We don't need anything. But all my vegetables are still producing vegetables coming into the building, and so we're getting this backlog of vegetables, and we only have so many freezers. And so we started making free casseroles every week and handing out free casseroles to the general public. And that was during COVID, and it turned out to be a huge thing. And that drew a lot of funding, and now we continue to hand out between three and four hundred casseroles every week. Every Thursday you can stop at Convivium and pick up a casserole. Um, it has self-weeded uh, self itself down to the people that really need it. Um, but, again, it's three hundred casseroles every week that we hand out, and a lot of those get my vegetables as well. Yes, ma'am? And what are your hours? The restaurant hours are Tuesday through Sunday, eight to two. We're closed on Monday and, oh, sorry, Wednesday through Sunday. We're closed on Monday and Tuesday. Do you have a website? Yes. Yeah, I should have brought some things, but I wasn't thinking about Convivium. Um, but we have a website, and we have a Facebook page, and I think we have Instagram, but I'm not that technologically advanced to know about Instagram. But we do have a website. Um, and an event bright for all the events that we have. You can get tickets for all my classes. Some of my classes are free, and a lot of the stuff that we do that's free is listed on the Eventbrite also, and the mailing list and all sorts of stuff. If anybody wants to come up for a tour, I just want to suggest you come when the tomatoes are ripe. You can come for a tour in October, and it's boring, because we're going to walk around the barren garden. But if you come during garden season, when everything's ripe, Basically, it's just me walking you around the neighborhood, feeding you things, shaking the garden, <laughs> which is fantastic. Because I grow a lot of, I try to, I always try to grow stuff that people that garden here don't know about. Because how boring is it to go to a garden and see like, ooh, a better boy tomato. Uh, I mean, they're great tomatoes by all means, but I want to grow something that makes you, I've never heard of that before. Did I answer your question? Is that enough convivium information? Yes, ma'am. Uh, going back to when we were talking about the mites that have bees, yep. do they affect our native bees also? That is a really good question, and I do not believe so. I, that's a good question, and I should find out about that. I don't have an answer for you on that, because I haven't done a lot of studying up on the native bees. Um, that's a good question. I don't... I don't know. I can't even throw a, an educated guess out. Most of the time in this situation, I would say, I don't know, and then give an answer anyway, but I, I don't have anything. I don't know. That's a really good question, though. I want to hope, no. We just affect the production of these that we farm. Um, I don't have a reason to think that other than hope. I overwinter them, and I, I hump because every year that I overwinter them, I increase my involvement 
you're supposed to like make sure they got a bunch of food, wrap them up, and let them be. But I lost a bunch of my hives the first year, and you know, I mean, you're, you're literally putting my life on the line for these animals, and I'm hoping that they're okay. And so I get emotionally attached to them. I lost a bunch the first year. The second year, I did more. Lost some. This year, I had three hives going into winter, and I fed those bees three times a week, all winter long. No matter how deep the snow, no matter how cold it was, I was out there. I made this food by hand. It was really hard to do because I'm a baby. And I was out there feeding them three times a week, and they all three survived the winter. Um, sugar and honey mixed together to make a peg, and they gobble it down like crazy. There's, there was one hive that, so typically what happens is the bees start the winter way down in the bottom of the hive, and then they eat their way up to the top of the hive, and then by spring they're at the top. But we've been having these really weird falls in early winter where it's been warm. Warm enough for the bees not to cluster up and start to hibernate, but cold enough that there's nothing for them to eat. And so because of that level of activity and warmth, they burn through all their food by the time December comes. And by the end of December, they're at the top of the hive saying, we're real hungry, boss. And so I fed them all winter long. But then as soon as spring came, they all swarmed. Bunch of jerks. How many eggs, cows, and bees do they come out in? No. Why you do uh, that? I put a thing called a winter box on the top of the Langstrom hive. Um, it's a real thin box, about that tall and it's got a wire mesh on the bottom. And I open it up and I put a patty in and I close it. Really quick, because I don't want to let all their heat escape, because they work really hard. They don't have a heater, it's just them. They have this thing where they, they cluster in the winter time. And they, the queen is in the center, and it's a ball of bees that's churning. And the bees on the outside are insulating and trying to keep warm, while the bees on the inside are going, oh, this is nice. But then eventually those bees go to the inside and they work their way out to the outside and everybody just keeps taking their turns and that cluster ends up eating the food that's right next to them and then when those warm spells they do this funny thing they won't they won't poop in the hive like i said they're immaculate cleaners so they don't poop in the hive they hold it but they have to have at least 40 degrees before they go out and i make a little bit of tiny little exit hole up at the top for them to leave and once it reaches 40 degrees, you can guarantee they just do this thing. <laughs> and all day long, it's these little poop guys. And I'm home all winter, and it's so funny because the, the snow is all spotted. You know, right outside the door, you can like, it's, they didn't like make it. But they'll hold it. And then, so I just put, I open it up, put a patty on that thing, and then close it. And they'll eat it within a couple of, I mean, like this winter I did, I fed them three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I fed them, and I'd give them a patty about the size of a healthy hamburger, and they would just, they would eat it. Oh, 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 all winter. Yeah. There's all sorts of books, there's all sorts of books that you can read that are just, that is, that's fascinating. And again, I'm honestly, I'm honestly just scratching the surface about how amazing, how amazing they are. Any other questions? Okay, thank you again. <laughs>